Okay, my friends, Roger Mafalsa University today going to prove electron flood theory. I'm not going to prove it. The people who live in more labs are going to show it. Now, this is a proton in electron flood theory. It's 1836 of what they call electrons. Well, an electron is not just a negative particle. It's now what they're referring to as an exciton. <laughs> Hold on. No, we're going to look at Livermore Labs. They realize they don't understand the nucleus. This is the nucleus that is electron flood nucleus. Not just a couple of big gigantic protons, a couple of big gigantic neutrons. No, every one of those is 1836 or 1837 particles. And then you get extra bunches of uh, particles collecting, it's forcing their way in accidentally in, you know, regions and then and they get locked into the core which is what they call an isotope. They don't want to be there. They should be a little less or a little more but they, they're semi-stable and they decay at somewhat regular rates. Now, that is the atom in electron flood theory. And an electron flood isotope would just be a couple extra little bar magnet balls hanging around on the outside that shouldn't be there and then they just go flying off. These are electrons or whatever you want to call them now. They call them excitons and the excess electrons create flow because there's always a bunch of extra electrons in everything there is. It's called ether. It's get over it. They, Plato knew it or they all knew it back then. And it's, it's what makes electricity flow through the air which is called static electricity. It collects on you. There's no question they're in the air. It collects on you and you walk through the air. <laughs> Where do you think they came from? Those are electrons free, free floating in the air. That's what lightning travels through to get to the earth. It's hard to get through there, but they're there and they, you can make them oscillate in the air. You could do all kinds of things with them, but they're in the air. There's a ton of them and I can show them in the light uh, research that I did with Rodney Warren. Okay, I'm going to make this kind of quick and simple. This is called Fiona. It's the super heavy atom factory and uh, Lawrence Livermore and Berkeley Labs are working on this apparently and they are trying to create super heavy elements by forcing elements to combine. Now, I have electron flood theory which says that all particles are made of tons of little particles, not protons. Protons and neutrons are nothing more than a ton of little particles, the same little particles that we call electrons. They are dipoles, they have a positive, they have a negative, they are in a ball configuration in air, they control a large region of space around a tiny particle that is a dipole and a ton of them congeal together to make the nucleuses in chunks of 1836 and 1837. Those are protons and neutrons. They add together and those attract electrons. They flood. The ones that flood to the core congeal until they hit what's called resonance frequency values. That is a number of protons, a number of these little particles, which is 1836, says, okay, I'm stable now. At 1836, I'm good to go. I am a proton. At 1837, I'm okay. I'm a neutron. You get more than that and less than that. I'm a little unhappy. I am an isotope. You go much more or much lower. I am going to fall apart. I am a nuclear decay particle. Now, let's look at something else. Okay, this is Fiona and this is um, Berkeley Labs and I'm going to let them play it. They're going to make, try to make heavy elements by forcing them together. I think Rod's Venturi and the work that I'm doing with the atomic theory can fix this, <laughs> make it better. To study super heavy elements. Its primary goal is to experimentally confirm their mass numbers. But before Fiona can measure the mass, the team needs to create a super heavy element. So we are in cave one. When I say when I say mass numbers, that's the number of particles that make up the mass of the thing. So here it goes. 
at the Building 88 facility. The beam comes from the cyclotron, which is right through that wall. And then it travels all the way down this line here until it reaches our target on the other side. All right, cyclotron is just a high-speed accelerator speeding up these particles kind of fast. And then they do what they do here, goes. This is what our targets look like, or this is three-fourths of a target. We have just a couple thousand atoms thick. All they're going to do is slam that thing like shooting a bullet into it, just accidentally hitting it, fat, you know, cascading into it, and then it just goes wherever it goes. Now, we have the Venturi, and it faces, well, you'll see. Of whatever our target material actually is. What we're interested in is one nucleus from the beam hitting one nucleus from the target and completely fusing. The problem is, that doesn't happen very often. Nuclei are very small compared to atoms. So, a nucleus... No, they're talking about a nuclei. Now, I'm talking about a nuclei being a ton of these, what they think are protons, and every one of these protons, I say, is 1,836 tiny particles. So, you've got a bazillion particles in the center of virtually every atom. They're shooting other chunks, like chunks of these. You could actually shoot particles, but they're shooting chunks. And it doesn't matter, chunks, particles, they're still going to be crushed in the venturi that I will show you momentarily. This is about 10,000 times mm -hmm. smaller than the atom itself. So when the beam comes in, what it actually sees is mostly empty space. So that. Right, it's mostly empty space. And they really want to keep that separation. They will push everybody away from that separation. That is their, their domain. Now, we want to come in and force everybody's domain to be in everybody else's domain. That's called plasma. Now, I almost think that it's, if we did it right, we could almost cause a a Bose-Einstein condensate <laughs> at room temperature. Usually you have to go to absolute zero to pull all of the particles out that are free floaters, and then the, the cores will all collapse onto themselves, causing a condensate. Now, I'm saying that we've just got a whole batch of things going on, and if we can make them crush into a Venturi, which I show you, we can. Would that create what they might call a condensate? It's just exactly the opposite of of, of a Bose-Einstein condensate. Bose-Einstein, you suck every particle out that's free, and then you end up with the cores, and the cores collapse. In in what I'm talking about is you force everything to make no cores but particles, and then so forced that the particles become the cores. And then you end up with a super heavy mo molecule. I don't know. I'm just guessing. And it's, it's, it's that's just really speculatory guess, but it's just it's possible. You know, I was looking up the Bose-Einstein condensate, and uh, that's all it is. They're taking every single extra electron out, that's all. And they're just ending up with the 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 the, the most stable of stable particles that are left inside that you can say, okay, give me those electrons. No, I don't want to hold on to that. Okay, well, at the end, around 273 below zero, it says, okay, that's, I'm going to keep it and you're not going to get it. Well, that's absolute zero, no electrons left, which means it will suck every electron you could put in. So they think it, it's, you know, uh, for some reason, some magic going on. When you put more electrons back into it, they just go dark. Well, of course they're going to go dark because the thing wants them so bad that it eats them. That's the way absolute zero works. It's given all of its electrons up. It wants them back. And that's why absolute zero, right in that range, you have free-floating electrons. They'll fly through there, and, and they, they're just... At that point, they are just free to go anywhere they want because there's nobody, there's nobody left to bounce in their way. They just right through.